this will be recorded. And uh, for those people who don't have Plutos yet, they're uh, they're either in the mail or in FedEx, and uh, you should be getting them uh, shortly. Um, unfortunately, it just never uh, worked out um, with enough time because we're just uh, uh, still getting accustomed to this. Hopefully, it'll be better for next year. But uh, just as introductions, my name is Robin Getz. I'm an engineer in analog devices, and I'm here with my uh, colleague, uh, Travis Collins. And uh, what we'll end up doing is kind of going through um, the Pluto workshop uh, that we've done in past years and hopefully get everybody up and running both with the Pluto and GNU radio and kind of talk a little bit about um, IIO and uh, how that works. Yeah, so, there are sections throughout the presentation. Uh, if you guys do have questions, um, you know, we'll be answering stuff in the chat. But if you want to voice up, there are um, stopping points in the presentation. So. So everyone's aware. But uh, because we have two presenters, uh, as I'm talking, Travis can answer questions. And as Travis is talking, then I'll answer the questions uh, in the chat windows. Uh, but to start out, you know, like what is a software defined radio? Um, you know, a lot of people think of them as like standalone boxes uh, connected to PCs, but almost everything is a software defined radio now. Uh, whether it be on the DJI drone, that communication link is all done in software or HDL, whether it be on robotics, whether it be on a handheld radio for um, public safety, or even uh, this little box in the corner here, in the side right here, is actually a box that uh, is deployed on trains uh, to monitor cell phone usage of the train engineer. And that's actually put in place by insurance companies because what they found is most of the train accidents that are happening nowadays are because of uh, train engineers not paying enough attention to what they're doing. Um, and uh, that ensures that they're not on their cell phones and those kinds of things. So. You know, a typical RF evaluation platform um, in the past has looked kind of like the like this. Um, I'm sure that uh, people who design radios, they kind of have benches like this uh, and they ensure that, uh, you know, trying to get their systems up and running. Um, you know, this was actually like an ADI evaluation system that we took out to a trade show and showed people like circa 2010. Um, and, you know, it was uh, a variety of different application boards, power supplies, USB applications on different PCs because they weren't all compatible. And it's, uh, it, it was very difficult to use and connect up to things like a, as a prototyping solution. So it needed some kind of small form factor um, system. Um, and that's what we were able to do with some of the in, uh, inventions and uh, discoveries we did at a semiconductor level using this zero IF kind of uh, system. So in the past, um, like in the long time past, uh, super heterodyne receivers were kind of used as the de facto standard for a lot of radios, uh, where things would drive through various mixer stages, various amplifier stages, various filter stages, and finally get into a single ADC. Uh, zero IF has kind of become the de facto standard for a lot of things. And then we're starting to move towards a, a direct RF where you, we just digitize everything um, and the converters are actually running at uh, six or higher, uh, you know, giga samples per second. Uh, and then it, that drives right into the ADC and in the, in the DSP. And sometimes this DSP is actually integrated somewhat in the converter itself to get down to reasonable data rates with uh, filters and NCOs and, and that kind of thing. Uh, this is really meant for narrower kinds of bandwidth radios now. Or narrower bandwidths are uh, 200 megahertz or 400 megahertz, uh, not just um, uh, like, Narrow is all relative, I guess. But the issue is, is like when we talk about the zero IF, which is the architecture that's inside the Pluto and the E310 and the Lime and RTL SDR and all these kinds of like uh, um, medium performance kinds of radios that people are, are familiar with, 
Uh, there's a variety of different things going on. You know, there's TX quad cal, there's baseband filtering, DC correction, LNA control, um, IQ tracking. It's more than just what's on the block diagram. It's all the different things making the block diagram work. And uh, we'll kind of have a look at that, you know, from an analog devices perspective, we have a variety of chips that kind of have these systems in them from uh, the 9363, which is inside the Pluto that a lot of people have on their desks now, to uh, the 64, the 61, the 71, the 75, the 9009, and then uh, the recently introduced 9002. Uh, so this was uh, announced at uh, last month's, or I guess it was, yeah, last month's IMS. So this is a newer device. Um, all of these devices, uh, I think the next slide, yeah, has a chart on here, um, although we didn't add the 9002 to it. You can kind of see that uh, there, there's definitely uh, a changes in bandwidth on the different parts, uh, different receive, different amounts of receivers or transmitters, um, TDD versus FTD. Um, different tuning ranges. So unlike the 9002, it actually goes from 30 megahertz to six gigahertz. So it kind of expands the 9364 tuning range, 9361 tuning range down to uh, 30 megahertz. And it does have actually an NCO inside it to actually do offset tuning. And you can use that NCO to shift down another 20 megahertz. So you can actually get down to uh, 10 megahertz receive. Uh, and then it has a variety of different EVMs, number of bits, uh, different interfaces as the bandwidth goes up or the sample rate goes up. So on these higher performance devices with uh, like 200 megahertz of, or 450 megahertz of bandwidth, it uses a high speed JESD 204B interface, uh, but it also consumes like five watts as opposed to the, the, um, the narrower bandwidth devices, which are much lower power. So you pay for bandwidth in terms of power as well. So um, ORX is an observer, a separate observer path. So you'll actually have separate ADCs for observers as well as uh, sniffer channels. But if we look at the Pluto SDR, this is kind of what the block diagram looks like. The, uh, oh, this, one, the screen on my Windows machine is like super slow compared to I think what everybody else is seeing. Sorry about that. Uh, so we have a, uh, you know, this LNA mixer stage, low pass filter ADC. That's kind of what we saw in our block diagram before. And that's what's kind of implemented in the chip. Here's our, uh, our two mixers. Uh, here's our LNA. Here is uh, the ADC. Here are some uh, half band filters for decimation and a programmable fur for uh, you know the low pass filter and equalization. And then inside the Pluto, it's connected to an FPGA, which is connected to an arm, which is connected to USB 2.0. And that's all in a single chip um, uh, Zinc 7000 device. And just to kind of get into a little bit for those people who are unfamiliar with the Zinc, it is just a single core arms. So you can kind of think that oh, this is a Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, and a small FPGA in a just a small 13 by 13 package. So it's just uh, all those things, including USB 2 on the peripheral side in a single chip. So we actually run Linux on the Pluto itself, and we'll show that in a little bit as well. But this is kind of what the device looks like um, from an I.O. perspective. This is kind of our uh, high level marketing diagram. We have one transmit path, one receive path, and USB 2. And this is what the PCB looks like because uh, we're a chip company and like to show people PCBs. But uh, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, you know, it captures IQ samples. It sends them to the PC for processing. You can do processing on the ARM inside or in the FPGA inside. There's actually custom... Uh, firmware images in the um, uh, amateur radio kind of side for doing like digital broadcast TV and a, a few other things. Um, and it's in this uh, $149 price point. Now, uh, it has guaranteed performance from 325 megahertz to 3.8. 
That's the chip that goes inside. Uh, as we talked about in, in previous sessions, um, you can actually uh, lie to the software and basically get uh, 70 megahertz to six gigahertz, but the uh, performance is kind of unknown. Uh, for most people, they find it works totally fine. Um, it's not that it won't work, it's just it's not guaranteed EVM performance. And in terms of what the design is really like, here we have our uh, Zinc, uh, the radio chip, the 9363, the uh, Micron memory, the uh, a USB Phi, and then just some power. And that's really all there is to it. Uh, one of the reasons we actually did the Pluto is not uh, just to kind of do the SDR pieces, but also to show um, our chip customers, our chip level customers, what a minimal design looks like. So the, the Plutos that everybody has right now really only has 72 parts on the bomb. Um, it's, it is a minimal kind of configuration which shows people how they can actually get systems up and running. Um, inside the Pluto, it does actually have 512 meg of memory that you can use for buffers or running Linux from, or uh, this is where your uh, RAM-based file system lives. Um, and then there's a small uh, 16 megabyte spy flash where the system boots out of. And it does pass FCC part 15 and CE tests and does achieve better than the datasheet specs. It does, it, from a block diagram standpoint, it kind of looks like this, where we have our uh, Zinc running Linux. Um, so it uses uh, build root as uh, our build system. Um, we have our memory, our flash, our USB Phi, some power, and the transceiver. And, you know, when we think about that, that's what a lot of, a lot of other commercial systems look like as well. It's uh, whether it's um, an evaluation board connected up to a FPGA target um, or a different eval board, meaning like a, a 9009 or 9002 or uh, 9361, you know, this side is like larger FPGA, less or more memory, more flash, some kind of connectivity and power. That's really what the this like Xilinx uh, Z board is. Um, it's really the same as uh, these like system on modules that Epic make or the Pluto or these system on modules that ADI makes. Uh, so from a block diagram, some a software architecture standpoint, they're all very, very close to the same or, or can be. So connecting with the Pluto, uh, when you plug your Pluto in, it should show up as actually uh, four different devices, um, mass storage, uh, and we'll get into that, why we do that in a second, uh, ethernet, and uh, you always get lots of questions when people are first kind of like playing with Pluto, it was like, well, why do we have ethernet? Um, and then the, uh, the goal or what they realize further on is ethernet is probably their most used interface because it just works all the time. Uh, trying to route USB over IIO through virtual machines can be problematic, but Ethernet always works. Um, serial ports, you can get to a serial console and IIO over Ethernet. Um, so when we plug things in, uh, maybe the mass storage. So Travis, can you just kind of exit out of here and then just like uh, show the, what the mass storage looks like? Uh, yeah, sure. Got one second. Uh, let's... Presenter. Oh, sorry. Yep. I have to make, give you control of your PC back. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me see. Let me just minimize this for a second. So hopefully, uh, everyone can see my screen now. Uh, uh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so, this is just a, you know, a dolphin window, but uh, you can see Pluto here shows up as a mass storage device. Uh, and there are a number of different files that show up on the mass storage. Uh, uh, one of the, the most uh, useful ones is uh, the info one, uh, which if I launch that, uh, you get a lot of information about Pluto itself. Um, you get um, instructions on how to get uh, LibIO, um, the different drivers, um, 
the different frameworks that we support. So obviously, you know, Radio, MATLAB, um, IOScope, which we'll be talking about later, um, other tools like SDR NGL, SDR Sharp. Um, and we try to link uh, to as many tools that support Pluto as we can. Uh, so if you don't see your tool listed here, uh, please let us know, and we'd be happy to uh, to add that into the uh, the manual pages. Yeah, send us a pull request. That's better. It's all yeah. on GitHub. Yeah, this is all on Git. Yeah, so there's just a, an HTML page you have to change. And so if if you scroll down there a little bit more, this is where you can tell what version of firmware you're using. Uh, what uh, if you scroll down a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. there we go. Um, it, what version of firmware you have, what version of uh, what serial number it is, what version of U boot the kernel, um, how to compile standalone applications and where to get the compiler for things. Um, can you just control plus to make that a little bit bigger, Travis? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, like what build settings were used, what the username and password is for the device, um, and which is absolutely changeable. And when it is changed, it doesn't show up there because hopefully you remember what the uh, configuration settings are for the device. So this will show up when you plug it in as 168.2.1. Uh, what the Wi-Fi settings are. So you can actually plug a Wi-Fi dongle into the Pluto itself. Uh, remember, it is just like a Raspberry Pi. And uh, wired Ethernet, if you plug it in, it, uh, it will do it where to get help and support. And then just a little marketing blurb about uh, analog devices if you want to engage a little bit more. So. All you need, all the documentation, all the pointers is uh, totally on this. So if you click on like back to the top or scroll up to the top, yep. some of the other things would be we have a lot of documentation and like there's actually a book. So if you go to the book drop down, so you can actually uh, download the entire PDF. And here's a book that actually Travis wrote most of. Um, that I helped out a little bit uh, that talks about um, mainly uh, some introductory pieces about software-defined radio, but then kind of gets into the, the critical pieces of um, the critical pieces theory of, and synchronization. Of, mainly, mainly synchronization and make sure you can uh, recover um, digital sorts of uh, signals and understand the synchronization pieces with examples. Um, I think a lot of, but in, in this text, um, all the examples are in MATLAB, but uh, we, we have had quite a bit of interest in, um, uh, you know, making things available in Python as well. And, uh, and, and people are definitely working on that, so. Yeah, if but, you are interested in, in Python examples, um, uh, Mark Lichman has a great website, uh, pysdr.org. Um, that has a lot of resources on using Python and, and Pluto to do digital communications. So if you go back, what were some of the other tabs? Yeah, so firmware. Um, book, and... Oh, help, help and support and the license, yeah. So to get help and support, um, you just click on the help and support button. It should take you to the, down the page to tell you where to get help and support online from. And then uh, the uh, the license, because everything is open source, that's where the licenses are for all the packages that are included in the firmware, including the HDL that goes in the FPGA. So 100% is all open under a permissive license. And uh, you can go find those on GitHub and uh, dig into the Pluto. You can, you can use the Pluto or use the Pluto as a reference design to design your own system. Uh, both from a hardware, HDL, software, uh, Linux kind of perspective, not just in uh, host-based Linux, but also embedded Linux. Okay. You want to swap back to the slides now, Robin? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Okay, so. So if there are questions about the Pluto, um, you know, definitely ask in the, the chat window. 
But uh, just to kind of recap, you know, it can be used as standalone. Um, I actually run um, uh, Dump 1090 on the Pluto itself. And, uh, you know, that kind of runs fine. Um, it's about the same as a Raspberry Pi 1, uh, single core, 666 megahertz, uh, USB host and device, uh, all open source, like I said. And you can get more information on these, uh, these links here. As well as in the textbook, there's a, a chapter called uh, Understanding SDR that uh, definitely has a lot of useful information in it. Do you have anything to add, Travis? Uh, I just want to make sure, you know, we're not like, um, this isn't an ad for the textbook or anything like that. Uh, we just found it. It's, it's a really useful resource uh, for people that uh, are uh, getting into communications. Um, it is a college level textbook, so um, you know, be prepared for some math. Um, if you're if you're a little bit, um, you know, want something a little bit, uh, you know, kind of knocked down on the math, I would definitely start with uh, Mark Lichman's uh, material. Um, you know, it's, it's very easy to understand, very practical. Um, and then if you want a little bit more kind of uh, more depth on the communication side, especially synchronization, uh, do look at the textbook, and it will help you understand how to do real over the air comms with hardware. Uh, so somebody asked about how much uh, GPIO is inside. Um, unfortunately, like, um, the answer is not a lot. The uh, The goal was to make this, uh, to design it for the price point and have a minimal system. So we tried to use the smallest uh, package that's possible just to keep it as cheap as possible. And that means that uh, I think there are like uh, six unused GPIO or, or seven, yeah, um, and I think plus I squared C and uh, spy, um, yeah, and then and there are some GPIOs coming off the ninety three sixty three that can be used for um, push to talk and controlling PAs and and those kinds of things as well. Yeah, a number of them go to the transceiver um, to do things like frequency hopping, and uh, you can manage the AGC with with pin control and things like that. Are all that are all over GPIO. And so the one of the interesting things of the Pluto OTG is it will auto mount any USB mass storage device like a thumb drive or hard drive. And then um, the auto mounter, what we've done is changed it a little bit so that it'll actually look for uh, shell scripts or files, which are called run me, and it will just run these shell scripts. So you can actually plug in a thumb drive, um, have a script or binary that plays out a waveform and you just plug it in, turn it on, and it will just play out that waveform or record that waveform, whatever the scripts can do. Uh, yeah, mass storage can be used to sa save or play the data. So what we do in the lab a lot is actually when we're um, testing out other platforms and we want a totally portable transmitter, which is sending out uh, CW or sending out some other kind of waveform, we'll just uh, make a little shell script on a thumb drive, plug that into the Pluto, take the Pluto, power it from a, a cell phone battery, the external USB batteries. And that is what uh, the second USB slot is for, is like when you're using the uh, USB in OTG mode, this is where it is powered from. Uh, yeah, and then to Travis's point is uh, Pluto is non-volatile. Um, there is no, uh, there is a very small flash partition used to save things like your root password and your SSH key, but uh, the rest of it, it's uh, it, it's all a RAM-based file system. So in terms of connectivity, uh, most people uh, would connect it up to a host just like this. We have, you know, Windows, Linux, Mac, uh, embedded Linux, Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone. Uh, a lot of people connect them up to like their embedded devices. They can connect up a thumb drive, um, a USB over Ethernet or USB of power over Ethernet, uh, Wi-Fi. Um, and these are all kind of supported uh, default out of the box. But because it is running Linux, you can recompile the kernel. You can add um, more USB devices to it and plug in like uh, USB speakers. So I did this um, and then just ran a small like FM decoder on here and uh, made the world's most expensive, worst sounding FM uh, radio possible. It's not as much fun as when you don't hear the joke, anybody laughing at your jokes, you can't tell if they're hitting or not. <laughs> 
Yeah, we'll, we'll Travis, track, Travis, Travis, Travis has heard them so many times. He just, he just like, oh yeah, I don't care about this. It's not funny. The, it wasn't funny the first time. It's not funny the thirteenth time. Uh, but anyway, th- when we talk about our evaluation and uh, uh, systems, you know, it's about scalability and moving, being able to move from Pluto these kinds of devices up into uh, the higher end devices into the system on modules into this device what we call the pack rf which is uh you know a system uh completely in a box with a little thumb wheel think like uh ipods or uh yeah ipod one had a navigation with a click wheel uh as well as a tiny little screen and power over ethernet and uh, push button power and uh audio in and out as well as these uh, higher end SOMs or system on modules. So this has like four channels of synchronized input output and it can be expanded up to eight channels driving into a single FPGA and uh, can be uh, actually have multiple SOMs all synchronized. Uh, to, uh, and that's at uh, 200 megahertz wide. So all, all of these things actually use a very similar API as what we'll be going through today called IIO. And uh, does the PAC RF screen use the second sync spy? Yes, it does. So it's a uh, uh, spy to LCD kind of interface. Uh, and I know, Travis, if you want to go over this section? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Yeah, so let me uh, just take control back from you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in this next section, uh, we'll be talking about uh, some of the low-level driver pieces, uh, the the software that controls the transceiver, and how we get data back into applications like uh, like a new radio or IOScope, uh, MATLAB, Python. They all use the same uh, underlying libraries uh, and drivers to talk and control everything. Um, now, just going back to this this simplified diagram of of 9361 um, or 63. Uh, that are inside the, the Pluto device. Um, you know, the there's a lot going on in the transceiver, but to actually make this work, there are a lot of components inside the FPGA, inside the arm, um, that are actually making uh, or controlling the transceiver to make sure it functions correctly. And uh, uh, there's a lot going on um, that people just aren't aware of. Um, and it's better to look at things from a system level perspective where we can look at uh, the transceiver, we can look at uh, the SOC, the Zinc, where you'll have some programmable logic, um, some, uh, some Linux um, running on the ARM, uh, and then on the host, uh, we, can sh- we, can, uh, we can show you how um, GNU Radio is actually talking uh, back to the SOC, which is controlling the transceiver. And we'll be filling this diagram in just so uh, it's clear uh, where the different pieces fit and how you can interact with them. Um, so the drivers for 9361 um, and the entire family uh, for 9361, 63, 64 are all written um, in uh, the industrial IO, uh, IO um, subsystem as part of the kernel. Um, so it's you know it's similar uh, similar to something like the, um, the the sound system subsystem or the input framework um, that exists in the kernel, but it's specific for devices that are like ADCs, DACs, accelerometers, basic sensors. Um, and obviously the transceivers. Um, and it has this very um, structured um, arrangement where at the top we have this concept called a context. And a context will be specific to, or will, will be basically a board that will have a number of different hardware components hanging off of it. And the context will have information associated with that. And it would be like things like the, uh, the kernel uh, version, um, the uh, type, uh, so it would be like, uh, uh, Ethernet or local contexts or serial contexts, um, uh, generic information that's associated with the, the at the bore level. And then as we kind of dig down, you'll have individual trees that come off uh, for um, for different devices. So uh, a device will have specific attributes associated with it, um, and that will have even more complicated attributes, what we call debug attributes, which you don't normally play with. They're kind of segregated off, um, and then uh, when we want to handle things like data that we're pulling back, you have things like buffers, and then we have specific channel information um, that would be specific to like a channel one, channel two, um, like in the transceivers, uh, where you can have, say, separate gain control 
on those individual channels. Um, things that don't specifically apply at the uh, you know at the full device level will be down at the channel level. Um, and if we take an example, um, say like the uh, uh, like the uh, a gain block or a variable gain amplifier, um, and how that driver would look inside uh, I/O. Um, so if you're familiar with how uh, kernel drivers are built um, or how you can interact with them, uh, it's simply done through SysFS. And if you actually log into Pluto or log into uh, our standard eval boards like uh, a Z board with a FM console attached, um, you could um, CD into sysbus IO and then look at a number of devices. And then they would have uh, some file descriptors that are associated with them. And these are the actual attributes um, that are associated with like gain control, which you can see here. Um, you can pull out some basic information like name, um, and they'll have a input-output relationship to them. That's associated with their, their like an, an input-based device, uh, like a receiver or a transmitter-based uh, device as an, as an output. And you can manipulate these attributes uh, just using cat and echo here. Uh, so we can echo out name or cat out name. We see the, the name of the device here. Um, and then we can do things like write in values uh, using echo, you know, just pipe that in, um, and we can see that the gain uh, was set to something close. And IEO is actually set up to be um, very human readable or human understandable, so it's not going to produce like a hex value or something like that. Um, and we actually see units associated with these with these values. And so it's supposed to be easy to use and very applicable to ADCs, DACs, generic sensors, things like that. Um, so if we go back to that diagram. Uh, that, that driver that we're talking about that's written in the IEO um, framework is actually in the kernel that's running on Pluto itself. And that's what you're interfacing with uh, when you want to control the transceiver, when you want to pull data back and forth from it. Okay. And you know, as a driver developer, uh, that low level control is really nice and what you're used to, but for a common user interfacing with a transceiver through file descriptors really isn't that convenient. Um, you know, you have to ASSH to it and then you know, poke and prod these different um, file descriptors. That's that's not uh, uh, that's not very helpful or useful, right? So, and if we look at uh, the drivers that are associated with the transceivers, they have tons and tons and tons of attributes. Um, the the devices themselves have uh, over a thousand registers, which translates to um, you know uh, uh, hundreds of and hundreds of attributes um, over the device that, that control things like. Sample rate, gain, um, uh, LO, transmit LO, receive LO, um, uh, different ports that you can select on the exterior of the device, um, different pin control modes, uh, the filters, um, all around the place. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I would say that most of these are um, ones that most people ignore. <laughs> like AGs, like there are uh, probably 28 settings for AGC. Yeah, uh, for, most for people attack. Yeah. For most <laughs> people just turn on AGC or turn off AGC. So it depends how how optimized you want to make the radio for your specific waveform. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it, you know the, the driver is there to allow you to get at anything that you want in the device. Um, but you can also use it uh, as uh, you know kind of a you know a, a, I would say more of a like an amateur or you just don't care about those pieces um, and, and just pull data back. Yeah, but, um, but the, these these drivers are also used by our commercial customers making their own radios where they want to optimize every little bit for their specific waveforms. So it's capable, all of these systems are capable of doing that. Yeah, so the defaults are, are, are pretty um, sane, we would say. Um, but if you want to get down there, you can kind of uh, dig into the attributes and, and tune things how you really want to. <clears throat> now, um, uh, to help with the uh, the process of actually controlling the radio, uh, a library was developed called LibIO, uh, and this uh, provides a C API uh, into actually interfacing with those different attributes, as well as a number of backends that allow us to uh, to talk to um, the transceiver or different I/O drivers um, over Ethernet, serial, PCIe, different backends. Um, so this is similar to you know like LibAlsa. Like you have also drivers, um, uh, LibAlsa is the way that you interface with them in the user space. Uh, LibIO is the same thing for IO drivers. Now, uh, how you interface with them 
how this might look is we have just a little C application here where we're creating a context and we're creating a, um, a Phi device. This Phi device would allow you to uh, write uh, channel attributes, or excuse me, uh, device attributes associated with that, that, that Phi. And then you kind of dig down deeper and deeper as you go, um, similar to that tree structure that we uh, showed in the previous slide where you would um, select different channels, different attributes associated with those channels, and do different things. Um, and if you don't want to use C, uh, or, uh, you can use um, the Python interfaces. Uh, there are C-sharp uh, bindings. Um, uh, there, there are Rust bindings, uh, a number of different languages. Um, you, know, you, can, you can pick uh, the language that you're more comfortable in. And, but the, the API is kind of remains the same. Uh, you create contexts, you, uh, you instantiate devices, uh, and then you, you edit attributes as, as, you, uh, as you would um, in other languages. Now, that kind of fills in um, most of the ARM uh, when we're talking uh, about the SOC. Uh, so we have this, uh, this library here that's running on the Zinc, and that's talking uh, directly to uh, the in-kernel driver for the transceiver itself. Yeah, so libio runs in user space. Yeah, and that's there to simplify the interface to the drivers um, as it handle things like error checking and, and making things a little bit more um, you know, sane. You can like pass doubles and things like that to uh, to the driver, which you wouldn't be able to do um, through the, the SysFS interface. Now, uh, just a little bit on the backends themselves. Um, so the backends uh, to Libio allow you to talk to uh, LibIO and the drivers associated with a given board um, remotely. And this can be done uh, over a serial interface. It can be done over um, PCIe. Uh, it can be done over Ethernet. Uh, and it uh, allows you to essentially write the same code that you would on that target device, but write it instead on your, your host system, where you know you have your dual monitors and your, your, your uh, big compilers. Um, you have GNU Radio, you have Malab, you have Python, you have uh, all these, you know, uh, more comfortable applications that you wouldn't uh, have on an embedded system. And uh, if we look at the diagram on the right here, we can kind of see how this this is laid out. Where on the left we have, so this is uh, the SOC, uh, or this is the yeah the the SOC. Um, you would have the like an uh, the FPGA and, and a and a device hanging off the end here. Um, but uh, LibIO itself right here is actually interfacing with the kernel and by extension, those IO drivers. And then uh, on the board itself, we're running a little daemon called IOD. And that's what the host application on the right here is actually communicating with. So you're running libio on the right, uh, as well as on the left uh, with uh, the embedded arm. Now, if you uh, log into Pluto, uh, you can actually look at the running process for IOD. Um, and this is actually what you're communicating with uh, when you're uh, using GNU Radio. So you're communicating with this little daemon that's doing the API translation from your host machine um, uh, into the embedded ARM and then actually updating the driver that's located on the ARM. Anything to add, Rob? Uh, no. No, I think that's a great description. Okay. Uh, so we are working on um, uh, UART uh, support for this. Um, it, it's, it, uh, I know there are a few people have asked for that. Um, so that, that is in process. Um, it's just not complete yet. So UART support works on the client side, but not on IOD yet. So it, it's, uh, half, half of it works, half of it doesn't. And, uh, the, the reason that is, is because there's a, a different actually, uh, backend, um, called tiny IOD that a lot of people are using. So they may prototype with Linux and get their system up and running. Um, and then they may want to switch to uh, embed or um, a while one loop or something like that that's not running Linux. So they, do, they can't run IOD. They still want to use the IO infrastructure. So what we did was we actually created a small, um, what we call tiny IOD, which can be run on devices as small as like a Cortex M4 or M3 to uh, and still have Python interfaces and have Py and, uh, and C on the host side, but uh, it's uh, your deeply embedded target on the device side and it just works over serial. 
Yeah, and, and since it's serial, like it's not blazing fast. Um, so, uh, which is why we always recommend people start off uh, with running the Linux on the board itself. It's just a lot simpler. Um, but when you want to uh, move over to uh, like a bare metal type implementation, uh, you do have uh, accessibility um, into the kind of the, the back ends or the, the, the infrastructure that you might be developing on your host um, with, uh, with LibIO. So it kind of just maps over for you. So just to you know, go back to that, uh, that, that diagram here um, and talk about more of the, the host side a little bit. Um, so on the host, which is uh, on the right side of the diagram, um, you are running LibIO. Uh, so, and this is what uh, GNU Radio is interfacing with. This is what uh, some of the command line tools, which we'll be talking about uh, in a second, uh, use. This is what SDR Angel, third-party apps like GQRX, they're all using under the hood. Uh, and this is what, if you wanted to build an application, you would build on top of. Uh, and as we've mentioned, there are a number of languages that we support. Um, the, the library is in, in C, so it's easy to add uh, if, if your language can uh, support C bindings or, or bindings into C. Uh, and they exist today for Node.js and C Sharp, Python, Rust. Um, probably a few more are missing, but uh, 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 usually um, uh, people, someone has already done them. Uh, if, if you're looking for that in your language. And the, the other thing to understand too is that um, IIO is an industry standard Linux thing. So it's not an analog devices thing. It's uh, other uh, semiconductor manufacturers and other vendors, uh, other consultants, other SOC manufacturers um, write IIO drivers. Uh, definitely analog device is a big contributor, but we're not the only contributor. And LibIO under LGPL is kind of agnostic to all those things. So you can use uh, this all this infrastructure with other people's devices as well as with analog devices parts. Yeah, a common thing that you'll see is um, if you uh, use the IO tools and you're like scanning for contexts that are available, um, if you have a laptop, uh, usually it will have like a back light controller. And a lot of the times that's written in as an IIO driver and that will show up. And you could actually talk to um, that backlight controller or like say the accelerometer uh, that uh, is uh, part of your laptop um, with, uh, uh, with GNU Radio if you really wanted to do that. Um, it's, uh, it might seem a little strange, but uh, like it's, it's uh, you know, since it's an IO driver, you just use libio, you tell what attributes that you want, you tell what buffers uh, that you want, and you can just pull data back from those devices. Yeah, so on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, one of our colleagues, Mark Thorne, gave a, a, a workshop on how to do what called Python for the rest of us, which showed how to do and actually create a, uh, a theremin from it, where you could control like um, control signals from the tilt and inclination of your accelerometer. Okay, so uh, just going back finally to fill in that last part uh, of this uh, kind of system level view, uh, where we have um, LibIO that's actually running remotely uh, on our host machine on our host PC. Um, and LibIO runs on Mac, Windows, Linux. Uh, I think we support FreeBSD now as well. Yep. Um, so when you're actually pulling data, um, GNU Radio is talking from LibIO over TCP IP, Ethernet, um, you know, serial, USB, PC, PCIe, um, whatever backend you select. Um, uh, then that is uh, interfaced uh, through IOD, which itself is running LibIO, and that controls uh, the IO drivers that are in the kernel, and that um, talks through the FPGA um, to uh, to the transceiver or any device that you have hanging out uh, uh, on the left here. Um, and this is pretty uh, since uh, this is pretty standard. Um, this could be a Pluto. This could be a system on module like an ADRV nine three sixty one SOM. Um, it could be an FM comms board. It could be a custom board that you make. Um, GNU Radio won't care because it will just be see. Oh, I see a driver. That's a 9361. Um, you could actually add multiple drivers onto the device, and you can inter interface with them directly uh, in GNU Radio. So if you uh, you know had some um, 
uh, driver that was controlling some GPIOs or something like that. Um, you know, Gear Radio would just see it as any other device, and you could control them directly. Okay, so uh, like any uh, good library, um, there are low-level tools that you can use to interface uh, with it. Um, and we have them in Libio called the IO tools. Um, and we just have a few examples here. So I'll, I'll drop out into a shell to just demonstrate some of these. Um, but uh, the basic ones are IO info, which is primarily used for just discovering devices. Uh, so if you want to see something is attached to your machine or on your network, uh, you can use that. Um, it's similar to, uh, I believe, uh, find USRP. I haven't used USRPs in a while, but I think that's the, the command line tool that you can use. Um, IO attribute uh, you can use for directly uh, poking at and reading back uh, different attributes. Uh, so in this example here, uh, we're just selecting uh, the 9361 driver. We're selecting the channel alt voltage zero, which is um, for LO control. We're, and we're setting the frequency to uh, 2.45 gig. Uh, IO read dev and write dev, these are designed for interfacing with the buffers. Um, and uh, so primarily we use them for debugging purposes, uh, for like measuring uh, link speech or just um, pulling back data uh, for, for simple debugging. Um, I know others have used them um, for full applications where they're like piping into to something else. Uh, but if you want to interface with them, you can use these kind of read dev and write dev to interface with the buffers directly. And if you really want to get low level, uh, you can actually write registers directly uh, with IO reg. Um, you know, uh, please avoid this if you can, um, because uh, it kind of uh, goes around the driver. And uh, if you're changing state in the part by toggling registers, um, the driver can uh, you can miss it. the driver cannot know what state the part is in anymore. Um, and we recommend only using IO reg uh, if you really know what you're doing. Yeah, it's typically used by driver developers or by people who are trying to figure out what the driver is doing. Yeah. Um, now, recently, actually, Robin, do you want to uh, discuss this slide? Sure. Um, so uh, when Travis talked about um, discovery, um, it's not just discovery over USB, it's also discovery over Ethernet. And that can be not just locally attached devices, but devices across your LAN. So what we actually use is uh, ZeroConf, which is part of uh, DNSSD. So uh, if you have a device that's sitting in your lab and you forget the IP number or don't know the IP number because there's no serial console or, or uh, you know, you don't have a display on it, you can just uh, go to the device, do IO info minus S, and it'll find the devices that are advertised as IO devices on your network as well as USB. So, uh, you know, you can, so that's like that IP Pluto.local is part of Pluto when it actually um, is broadcasting on the network. And it just happens to be that it's uh, 192.168.2.1. Um, if you want to uh, look, so, Every all of those IO commands they actually support um, IO or IO info uh, minus uppercase S. You can do IO attribute minus uppercase S, and it'll do the same thing. Um, if you want to specifically look at IP contexts, uh, you just put space IP after, and it'll only look for things in the network. And here it found the device that's attached locally to uh, my uh, laptop on Pluto, as well as a different device I had on the network. And I think when uh, when Travis sees this, he uh, because he has a VPN into our test infrastructure over in China, his network, he sees like six different boards there actually um, that are all IO as well. Yeah, I think they're all off now, but uh, yeah. if, if I scan uh, with the VPN, they show up as like test jig and um, I can log into them remotely um, if I want to or not. And, and again, you, you, this is, uh, it's all auto discovery. So you don't have to remember the IP number or find the IP number. You can just connect to, you then use it to connect to IP colon Pluto.local and it'll determine what the IP number is for you. Yeah, and this works on uh, Windows, Linux, Mac. It's all built off of ZeroConf. So on, on you know, Linux, that would be Avahi. On Windows, uh, Bonjour and uh, Bonjour on, on Mac.
Okay. Uh, so something that's relatively new that I wanted to mention um, around the Python support that we have. Um, so uh, if you look on the left, um, this is an example of what it would be like to uh, control uh, Pluto uh, using the IEO bindings. So you need, um, so it's a bit verbose uh, just because there's so much flexibility and control uh, within LibIO. Um, so it, it's really designed for that you know, extensibility and flexibility which can be a little bit uh, daunting for first time users. Um, so what, what we've actually done is created a, a Python module called PI ADIIO, uh, which is actually built on top of um, LibIO and simplifies a lot of this interfacing. So instead of uh, doing writing all of these lines, you can just simply write these instead and you get the same effect. Um, and these are all just properties uh, that, that are settable um, and you have simple methods to read and write data. Um, buffers are I would say uh, the most usually challenging aspect of interfacing with things in LibIO uh, using just the, the bare metal API, uh, just because you need a lot of calls and you have to interpret the data in a correct way. Uh, so Pi ADI really makes that simple for you. Um, and you can actually install it through uh, PyPy today. Uh, we just uh, pip install Pi ADI IO. This is really designed for to streamline um, using uh, devices. Uh, and we don't have, just have SDRs, we have sensors and all kinds of things. In the library or in the module yeah so so io is the the low level io interfaces that work with everything it just uses lib io um pi adi iio is uh has device specific pieces in it like it'll be adi pluto or adi 9361 um and and that's where um it's a little bit more pythonic but it's more device specific yeah, and it will do things like uh, translate um, the buffers into units that you would expect uh, into SI units sometimes, depending on the device, um, and not just uh, like raw ADC codes that uh, you might normally get from the um, uh, from the direct IEO interfaces. Uh, and if you want to take things up uh, a layer where you want to have a GUI, uh, we do have an open source tool called IEO Scope, um, and this is. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the most beautiful tool in the world. In the world, um, it's, it's name, designed name by an engineer. A G, name a GTK application that is. I can think of a later, but uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. maybe someone in the chat will, will know a, a good, yeah, <laughs> pretty GTK application. G GTK two. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, IEO scope uh, it has time domain plots, frequency domain plots, constellation plots, uh, kind of the standard stuff that you expect from a. Uh, uh, like an evaluation type software. Um, there's no DSP inside of it, but if you just want to get data back and uh, figure out some settings with the transceiver or different devices, it is a plugin based uh, application. So we do provide plugins for uh, a number of different devices and boards, um, but you can write your own as well. Uh, and we, we have a number of customers that do that for, uh, for their special platforms. So Travis, there's a question in the chat window about namespace collision between GRIIO and Pi ADI IIO. Yeah, yeah. Th this is a like a known problem. Um, so uh, we're um, uh, there's a grep out to merge um, uh, GRIO uh, into um, mainstream uh, GNU radio. Uh, so that will get rid of that problem just because it will change the namespace uh, of uh, of IIO um, to uh, because it will be part of, of GNU radio. Um, so th this is only an issue for uh, 3.8 right now. Um, we are aware of it. You just you can't use them together. Uh, so we will likely change them in the the 3.8 branch. Um, it's just uh, something we haven't done yet. Just to be aware, so you can't simultaneously use the Python bindings as well as uh, the GNU radio blocks because of the namespace collision. Okay, um, and uh, the zero comp that uh, uh, Robin went to is also available um, directly in IEO scope. Um, so th this is actually uh, pretty new. Um, so if, if you've had IEO scope installed, uh, you might not have a connections window that looks like this. Uh, but uh, now you have the ability to kind of filter um, auto discoverable contexts. Uh, you can connect to our serial now, uh, as well as manually put it putting in URIs uh, if you know a specific board that you want to talk to. And this really just makes it simpler for you to interface 
with a number of devices if, if you have a bunch that are on your network. Okay, um, so now I'm just gonna just drop back into my machine and just uh, show a little bit about um, using IEOScope itself, um, as well as using some of the IEO tools. And Robin, can you let me know when you can see my screen? Uh, I can see it. Okay, great. Um, so uh, on my machine, um, so this is uh, my, my, my Linux box, um, I do have a Pluto connected. And if I type IO info dash s, you can see I have uh, libio installed with uh, local backends, XML backends, IP, USB, and serial. Uh, and we can see that I have a Pluto device hooked up with the URI uh, USB 12, uh, 1275. Um, so these are important when you want to specify which device you want to talk to. Um, since I have uh, a zero comp set up as well, um, the IP based uh, address for Pluto shows up here as well at the bottom. So the, it's not that I have two Plutos, it's just I'm seeing both contexts, the, uh, the USB context as well as the, uh, the IP based one. And these other devices here are other um, platforms that I just have on my network. Um, I work with a lot of IO devices. Um, so these are, um, the top one here is actually a Raspberry Pi that has a beamformer hooked up to it. Um, and then these two are actually uh, system on modules with different carriers. So the, the carriers have uh, different devices on them, which is why we see different drivers that are outlaid here, that are outlined here. So I'm just gonna be using this, uh, this USB context um, and we can uh, just go over some of the how you might use like IO attribute to uh, write different settings to a device. So if I use IO attribute, I say uh, U to define the context. I can then list the drivers that are associated with that context, or list the devices that are associated with it. We can see that there's a, uh, so the, um, the device on the bottom here, uh, 89361 LPC. This is actually the driver that controls uh, the receive portion uh, of the device. Uh, primarily the DMAs. Uh, there are a few controls in here that allow you to do things like phase rotation um, and, and gain correction um, as well. Uh, the one above it, um, DDS core LPC, uh, this is for the transmit half of the device. Um, and it's called DDS core because uh, they're actually DDSs that you can control, tone generators essentially, um, that you can control um, in the FPGA. Uh, and you can, uh, there are, um, four independent DDSs per IQ pair. So two DDSs per individual um, uh, like DAC. And you can do things like um, uh, like dual tone tests pretty easily uh, with those DDSs and they're really helpful for um, just debugging and, and uh, general usage of the device. XADC, this is the ADC on the FPGA itself. And you'll see this on, on the Zinc platforms and the ultra scales. Uh, but the most interesting driver is this guy here. So 893.61.Phi, uh, this is the main um, Phi driver for the device, uh, which will um, uh, control most or contain most of the attributes that are uh, associated with things like um, gain control, um, changing LOs, uh, setting um, sample rates would all be done through the Phi driver. And this is common uh, a common arrangement that we have for all of our transceivers where you would have a Phi at the top, and then you'd have uh, two essentially um, uh, drivers, one for transfer, one for receive. Uh, for the devices that have observation pass uh, or sniffers, they would have an additional driver that, that would say like OBS or uh, SNF in them. So if we uh, simply tack that on to uh, our command here, uh, we can list the uh, device attributes for uh, uh, for the that are associated with the uh, fly device here. And we see that we can set the calibration mode, um, the, 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 the oscillator tune, uh, the enable state machine that's in the transceiver and get really, really low level here um, if you want to. Uh, so the, the device attributes are associated with um, kind of things that apply across both transmit and receive. Um, and if we dig down into an individual channel, clear the screen here for a second so we can see stuff. Um, I can change this D 
can see, we can see the individual channels. So they'll always have a naming convention like voltage, uh, voltage one, uh, voltage one I or Q. Um, and uh, then they'll have tags, which might, or IDs that make them easier to understand. So alt voltage one uh, is actually uh, the channel that controls the transmit LO. And if we tag on, uh, say, like voltage zero, it's this command, we can see the channel attributes that are associated with the channel voltage zero. And then we, you know, we get more interesting things like hardware gain control, um, uh, RF bandwidth, um, we can pull back RSSI, sam uh, sampling uh, frequency, filter control. Um, and you can see that uh, there are both input and output uh, specific channels. So uh, there'll be a voltage zero that's specific to the transmit side and a voltage zero that's specific to the receive side. Um, and what we can do is if we just clean this up again, we can add a like an I flag, and that will only give us the input attributes. So anything associated with the receiver, and we can do a, a a dash O and give us anything that's associated with a transmitter. And so some people may be thinking right now is like, hey man, uh, you know, the last thing I want to do is uh, do a bunch of typing. I just want to use stuff from the GUI. And uh, you know, the answer to that is like, you know, that's, that's absolutely possible. That's the way most people use it. These tools are typically when the GUI is doing something you're not quite sure what's going on, and you want to get down to that lower level to actually see what's happening on the device. Yeah, yeah, and and when you want uh, that GUI, um, so I have uh, IO scope installed, um, so I can just type uh, type OSC, OSC, and this will actually launch IO scope for me. Right. Um, or or I was going to say um, when you want to make something reproducible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, when you want to script something, it's a lot easier to do it with these, uh, like a sh little shell script, than it would be to do trying to automate something in some giant GUI. Yeah, and, and that's how we actually write like a lot of our tests um, is using just the I IO tools. Or if you interface with us on our support forums, uh, we'll ask you to use those tools just to get an idea of what's going on with your device at the lowest level. And it's uh, it's they're extremely useful debugging tools. OK, um, so next, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, IOScope, which I have launched here. Um, so when you launch IOScope, just forget about this window for a second here, um, you'll get this, this window here. That's what we call the, uh, the connection window. And you'll be able to select uh, a number of um, uh, different options from local devices. Uh, since I don't have any um, physically attached um, or directly attached devices, um, uh, on my device, nothing will show up here. Um, you'll you'll get uh, a drop down. Um, uh, I don't have, uh, but uh, I do. I can uh, select um, remote devices. So I'm just putting in the IP of Pluto here. Uh, if I hit refresh, we'll see the same device uh, drivers as we saw before. I can change this to the different context that we were using before, which was one I believe two seven dot five. I hit refresh. Yeah. Okay, so I see in the same device drivers. I'm just using the USB context in this in this case. And then once I you know I pick the device that I care about, I just hit OK, and that will actually give us our main control window. So um, IO scope itself is um, broken out into tabs, so we uh, that give us different levels of control of the device. Um, the main tab you should really care about is just this AD nine three six X tab, uh, where we can get access to um, all of the configuration of the transceiver. Um, there are lots and lots of controls of the device, uh, things like uh, the enable state machines, uh, which allow you to do like FTD or TDD, or pin control, where you can individually control the transmit or C pass, bring them up and down. Uh, you can see the, um, the RX uh, clocking pass, the TX clocking pass. Uh, we can load filters into the device. Uh, we can set uh, the RF bandwidth. We can set the um, sampling rates. Uh, interact with the LOs directly, turn on all the trackings, uh, giving you all the knobs. Uh, if you want to dig down further, there is an advanced tab here um, where you can uh, get down and do things like set individual settings for the AGC where we want like um, my outer threshold high um, AGC setting, which I'm not really sure what that does, but you can change it if you want to. Um, you can get at the uh, the BIS controls where we can enable loopback pass and things like that uh, inside the transceiver and inside the FPGA. 
Um, but the, just the last thing I wanted to show was uh, if you want to pull back data or, or interface with the buffers, you can create what we call a capture window. And that's just by selecting file and new. You can have multiple of these running simultaneously. I'm just going to close the second one. Um, but uh, if we go to this capture window, um, so it works on by selecting the channels that you care about. So here we have voltage zero and voltage one. These are I and Q uh, from Pluto. We can hit play, and I'm just pulling back some data here. And I can change the plot from time domain for, to frequency domain. And I can see that I'm transmitting a tone over here. There are things like markers and um, uh, fixed markers, single tone markers, image markers, um, lots of utility in this tool if you want to uh, dig down and, and uh, just debug something in a really simple way. OK. So let's uh, switch back to the slides. So does anybody have any questions on that? So, um, you know, IO scope is just a little tool to typically do, you know, basic, hey, is my device alive? What's the performance? What's the SNR? Just to take some basic measurements to uh, to see how it's acting, and then there's enough controls to uh, to play with things. Just moving up my desk a little bit so the sun's not uh, beaming in. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say close your blinds. Uh, yeah, they're kind of out of reach. Um, oh, okay. I live in, in California, so uh, this it's uh, still pretty early. Yeah. Eight is early for California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so um, if there aren't any questions, um, so this is uh, the lab portion uh, of the session. Um, so uh, the 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 lab uh, I basically kind of went through it when I did the, those examples uh, when I went into the uh, using the I/O tools um, and using I/O scope. Uh, so the that whole process that I went through is documented in the uh, in the lab guides uh, that are um, that are in that link that are in the shared notes and are at the beginning of the chat. Um, so if you want to do that on your own, um, you know. Uh, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, if you have any questions about them, um, please let us know in the chat. Um, but since uh, we weren't able to get radios out to everyone, um, uh, we are going to kind of skip over that portion right now. Well, so uh, Travis, do you just want to yeah. show people where the lab is? Oh, where, yeah, where yeah. The labs are? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll post it again in the chat, the uh, the location for the... So the, um, the labs are linked off of... There's public chat. Okay. Or linked off of this page. Um, and there are two lab guides. Uh, one is for using um, Pluto SDR uh, with the IO tools, like I demonstrated, and using uh, IO scope. Um, uh, uh, yes, the device that we're sending out were for people that signed up uh, for this session. Uh, it was for the first 50, right, Robin? Yeah, yes, it was for the first 50. Yeah. Um, but the, the labs themselves, um, they're, uh, very, um, they're very guided, and they walk you through uh, interfacing with uh, the I.O. tools, um, pulling out basic information, like I showed, using um, I.O. attribute, I.O. info, um, poking at different aspects of the, the transceiver, on Pluto, as well as um, going into IO scope and uh, doing something a little bit more interesting uh, than just looking at a tone. Um, but they are, are fully self-guided. Um, uh, if uh, if you run into any problems uh, outside of the session, you know, feel free to reach out to Robin or myself. Um, uh, you can always go on our support forums and Engineer Zone, and uh, like myself, Robin, uh, others on our team, uh, uh, always answer questions there. So you can always get to the source of uh, who wrote things and who maintains things. Right. So, so Travis, did you just want to do the, the uh, just kind of walk everybody through the final part of the lab with the constellation pieces? Yeah, sure. 
So. So the the lab that we would be uh, going through um, is uh, the uh, the IEO scope. Yeah. So uh, the de device devices were sent out. They just uh, got stuck in shipping a little bit, um, but they they should be to you fairly relatively shortly. Yeah. So um, the uh, what the the so the lab um, will go over some of the basic um, using the IO tools, as I mentioned. Um, um, at the end of it, um, we actually have you load up uh, one of the buffers. So as I mentioned, uh, there are DDSs in the transmit path that you can control. Um, and if, we, if you scroll down in the panel um, on the transmit side, so uh, if you look at kind of the tabs, we have the global settings, we can collapse that. We have the receive chain, we can collapse that. We have the transmit chain, we can collapse that. And then at the bottom, we have uh, our FPGA settings. And this allows us to control the buffers uh, as well as the DDSs inside the FPGA. Um, so here we can see that uh, we're just uh, viewing a tone just because we have the DDSs on. And I can change, say, the uh, frequency of that tone. I can swap it over to the other side. Um, I can increase uh, the frequency of that tone pretty easily. Um, and if you saw those two tones show up um, and then being knocked down, that's actually the IQ correction. Um, kicking in and knocking those down. Um, but the, the last part of the conclusion of the lab is actually loading up a waveform. And we'll just do that by selecting DAC output buffer, selecting a file, and we're going to select just a, a simple QPSK waveform. Uh, and we're selecting one that's uh, just symbols, essentially. So there's no filtering applied to it. Um, so there's, you won't see any smearing uh, across the symbols themselves. We just load that up. And we're going to need to turn off Gear Radio. Uh, Reconnect to the uh, to the board here. So that that is one thing we haven't mentioned is that um, the way uh, USB contacts work, our USB contacts are exclusive, meaning only one application can see the uh, or connect the device at, at one time. So if you do have GNU Radio open or do have uh, um, IO scope open. The, uh, and attach the radio, the other one won't be able to find it. Uh, network context, on the other hand, anybody, any number of uh, devices can connect, which can either be great or terrible. Uh, it can be great that it works, you can play with attributes, um, but if you start doing buffers or start doing things the other one doesn't understand, then that can be um, on the terrible side, and you'll end up with uh, weird kinds of issues like Travis, I think, was seeing. So it's always safer to only have one um, application talking to the radio at once. So that, that's enforced on USB, but not enforced on um, Ethernet. Which means that when you're using um, a GNU radio or IO scope, you can always go to the command line and talk to the radio over IP and see what the applications are actually doing which is uh, great for debugging and um, playing with knobs that may not be accessible to you in, in the, uh, the application, in the GUIs. Or one of the other devices that I have. OK. I think I actually have GNU Radio running in another window. But I'm not really sure what's on that desktop, so I don't want to scroll down to it. Um, okay. Load. Uh, 
So this is a like a QPSK waveform. I know it's super obvious by this plot, um, but if we look at the uh, the constellation, we can we change this to the points. You can actually make out QP, uh, QPSK. We crank this up a little bit. Um, so uh, the reason why uh, it looks like this is actually just because um, we're not perfectly sampling uh, the, the signal that's coming back, right? So we have some timing offset, some fractional timing offset in the data that we see. Um, and we can kind of play with this a little bit if we change, for example, the sample rate. So we change sample rates to 20 megahertz. Um, this, you know, it will change to some other random offset that's associated with the distance between um, the uh, uh, the um, uh, the transmitter receiver as well as the sample rate in the LO that we're operating at. Right. And, and, and an interesting thing that a lot of people do is uh, if they want to better understand the data that they're sending, you can actually go to the advanced tab. Oh, that's never a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, so this is probably the board that uh, reflashes itself every 20 minutes for testing. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's definitely the case. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so load that waveform back up. PSK, filt, Oops. select some valid channels, links. And as, as Robin mentioned, so if we go to the advanced tab and we go to the BIS settings, we can actually turn on um, uh, digital loopback. So, so actually... BIS, BIS stands for built in self test. And we auto scale, uh, you can see that now we're actually getting points back. And so, so th that that is the data that we're sending out. And uh, if we looked at the time domain data, and you probably need to change it to like 400 points, you can see that there's, uh, we're basically sending out square waves. And uh, for those people who kind of like understand the theory a little bit more, uh, if we were to send out square waves, uh, we'd need basically infinite bandwidth. So, that, so that's why there's all that inner symbol interference is because we're sampling things at all the wrong times and we can't sample square waves and get them back again over uh, a narrow channel. And we can actually see that by going back to Constellation and actually changing our signal bandwidth and will actually change the way the uh, the constellation looks. Yeah, so this is the, definitely the device under test uh, upstairs, um, which is why we're seeing this because it's actually cycling the radio. Yeah, all your uh, tests are failing now. That's the problem. All your... <laughs> um, okay, but I think everyone got the gist of that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, uh, the, the, the lab guide kind of goes through this and then talks about things. And, and uh, Travis's constellation looked actually pretty square um, with respect to the receiver. But uh, Travis, if you still have, if you go to, uh, if you go back to OSC for a second. Yeah. And just bring up the block diagram. Thanks. So um, in OSC, there is the block diagram of the parts uh, just to try and uh, ensure that you have that documentation available to you when you need it. You can kind of see that the receive LO and the transmit LO are totally separate and unique on this device. And they're not, um, even though they may be the same frequency, they will not be the same phase all the time. So that could cause rotation of that constellation just as phase happen, could happen to be like uh, exactly the same, which is seems what to be happened in Travis's example, or it could be totally different um, and be random. Uh, and that's what'll cause this uh, unknown rotations between receive and transmit. 
And because OS doesn't have any signal processing in it, there's no carrier offset correction, there's no frequency correction, there's no uh, retuning of things. Uh, you basically get what you get. And, and that's why we have interfaces to tools like uh, new radio where we can do more advanced signal processing. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, yeah, these are regards to the lab. Um, but the, the the as Robin mentioned uh, in IO scope, there is no single processing. Uh, so, if you wanted, you know, to uh, handle like carrier offset or handle that rotation um, that we're seeing, or that that um, fractional sampling um, offset that that we're seeing, uh, you need timing correction. You need match filtering. You need all that DSP uh, to correctly handle the signal coming back, and which is where really GNU radio comes into play. Um, and as Robin mentioned, uh, just to give some detail to that, um, you know, the the fractional uh, offset that we're seeing is just because the distance between the transmitter and receiver is not an integer sample, um, and we're seeing also a, a rotation shift because the PLLs themselves. Um, are actually separate uh, on uh, transmit and receive. So this is the PLL for receive that drives up into uh, these mixers, and this is the PLL for transmit that drives up into these mixers. Um, and because they're separate, you'll have a random phase shift that are associated with them. And every time you actually retune the PLLs um, or change the LO, uh, the phase will change. Um, and this is just a kind of a little demonstration of uh, you know mathematically uh, what timing offset would look like. So uh, for QPSK, you have these transitions between uh, you know, minus one and one uh, and back and forth. Um, and when you want to sample the signal um, perfectly, uh, you want to do it at these you know th these uh, these transition points um, and not uh, or sorry, not at the transition points, like not here, but at at uh, uh, actually the peak uh, of the symbol themselves. Um, so as you uh, kind of move across that that's uh, that symbol, uh, you'll get different uh, images in the constellation, or different perspectives of the constellation. So this, if you sample it at this position, you would get something that looked like this. Um, oops, uh, if you uh, shifted this red line a bit um, and keep shifting it, you'll see smearing and more smearing uh, in the constellation, uh, which is uh, that. Uh, uh, that uh, fractional offset that we see, uh, which is common for any communication system. And this will change um, uh, over time uh, when you have uh, disjoint radios just because the oscillators in them. Yeah, so uh, Barry, just uh, uh, point out a, uh, a great link about uh, the uh, some of the math that's behind the corrections that you would need to do uh, for uh, a QPSK or any PSK uh, style communication system. Uh, and how you adaptively handle these offsets. And uh, this is a PDF, so we can't see the embedded video in it. Uh, but uh, to just dig down a little bit deeper inside the, the transceiver itself, um, so this is just the same diagram that we saw on, on, on the left here, but, but on the right is actually what's inside the FPGA. Uh, so when uh, you're actually um, uh, uh, you know, talking to the device or playing with those DDSs, you're actually controlling them inside the FPGA. And there are uh, four per IQ pair, which allows you to do dual tone tests. Uh, but there's also a number of different components inside the FPGA that allow you to actually tune this interface between, um, between the chip and the FPGA, which is required to uh, maintain a stable connection. And uh, we actually um, um, do this by using these uh, loopback paths inside the device. So when we were uh, selecting actually the, the loopback, um, what that would do is actually generate data on the transmit, loop it back inside the chip, and then shoot it back um, to the, the DMA buffers on the receive side. Uh, and this is really handy for uh, just debugging things, uh, making sure that you're transmitting what you expect. Um, and then there is this additional option, uh, which we call RF loopback, uh, where you can uh, take in a, sig a signal on the receive side and then feed
feed that back to the FPGA and then shoot it directly back out the transmitter. Um, and this is really handy for uh, RF engineers who just uh, want to see what the, the transmit and receive chains look like and not to have to like futz with anything inside the FPGA or pull things something back into your radio. Uh, they'll have like some instruments hooked up. They just want to generate something in and see it back out on some spectrum analyzer or something uh, or a VNA or something like that. Okay, uh, so that brings us to the last part, uh, which is how we actually bring together GNU radio and IO. Uh, and this comes in the form of our auditory module called GRIO. Uh, now, the GRIO is uh, you know, available as an auditory module like, uh, uh, like most other ones on uh, GitHub today um, through the Analog Devices uh, Organization page. Uh, there are two main dependencies for GRIO. Uh, one is obviously libio, and one is lib ad9361. Uh, so this library is required uh, to do things like on-the-fly filter generation, which is required for um, specific sample rates and modes of the device. Um, so you can't use, uh, you can't really use the, the, the transceivers, um, or you can't use them very well uh, without this library. Uh, now, if you are on Windows, we do have a Windows build. Um, that's for 3.7 uh, that you can install directly um, and is uh, really handy uh, if you just want a kind of a, a simplified uh, GNU radio release that just has the uh, GRIO installed with a number of different uh, other auto tree modules as well. Um, now, as part of the, the auto tree module, there are a number of different blocks that are associated with it. Um, the main ones that um, the this community would primarily use would be the SDR blocks. So we have blocks for the FM comms boards, uh, which are uh, FMC based devices. Uh, we have uh, blocks for Pluto, obviously. Um, there are generic blocks inside uh, as well. Um, so these are for directly interfacing with IO attributes, um, reading from them, writing from them. Um, you can um, uh, produce data as messages or tags or um, streams if you want to. Um, and there's this kind of extra set that uh, people tend to get confused about, which is these math operation blocks. Um, these are specifically designed uh, for uh, our SCOPY application, which uh, is actually a, um, a uh, an application that we maintain for um, this instrumentation product that's similar to Pluto um, called um, M2K. And under the hood, uh, this, the application Scopy that uh, interfaces with that actually runs GNU Radio and uses a, a number of math blocks. And we had to extend GNU Radio a little bit to, to do some of the things that we needed to do uh, for Scopy. And that's why those uh, those blocks exist in the library. Uh, these actually will be removed um, and uh, put in a separate ad free module uh, called GRM2K uh, when we uh, merge things into um, mainstream GNU Radio. So if you are using them today, uh, they are uh, actually currently split out um, in the auditory module of GRM2K. Okay, now uh, just to, so you kind of understand the, the structure of the blocks themselves, um, they actually have a inheritance um, arrangement. Uh, we have uh, basically generic blocks that sit at the bottom, uh, device sync and device source blocks uh, that the FM comms and Pluto actually inherit from. Uh, so if you have a device uh, like or a driver that you want to interface with that a block does not exist or a device specific block like FM comms or Pluto exists for those devices, um, but one does not exist for yours, you can actually interface with that directly with uh, the IO um, source and sync blocks. And under the hood, these are just um, kind of instantiating them and uh, applying some parameterization to them as well. Um, and what's what's great is that uh, since it's generic, uh, we can actually talk to um, uh, uh, custom devices. Um, we have um, you can actually use the E310 to actually talk to um, if you have the I/O drivers installed uh, on the device. Uh, you can actually use the I/O blocks to talk to that to stream data back. You can use the generic uh, device uh, source blocks to talk to things like the Sidekick. Um, uh, device, you can talk to the PACRF with that as well. Um, so it's it's really flexible in, in this way. 
Um, and just to be aware that you know, if maybe there's something that's not no parameter available for Pluto that you want to get access to, say like there's some register that you want to set or some uh, some uh, you know non-common um, attribute that you want to use, you can actually um, write that in this block and implement the same settings that we have in Pluto using this uh, generic block here. Now, just to dig in, into the little details. Um, so the, the, there's a question about uh, how do you install GRIO on E310? Uh, so it's uh, it's not that you actually install GRIO on E310. Uh, you just have to install a kernel that has the IO drivers associated with the device. So uh, ADI actually maintains a full um, reference design for the E310, uh, as well as uh, uh, the, the necessary drivers. And um, we did some modifications to handle the front end filters for that device that's available in our device tree. And we have a page that shows how to install that um, or to create an SD card for that particular device um, and to get the correct device tree for that as well. So if you want to run IO uh, on uh, E310, it's a pretty straightforward process. Do you want to add anything there, Rob? Uh, no, I think, I think that's it. So somebody mentioned on the thing, um, so, GRIO on an E310, uh, actually, there's a SD card you just pop into the E310, and it should just work pretty much out of the box um, and go from there. Uh, the it, it runs the analog devices distribution uh, for the E310 um, as opposed to the Edis distribution. Um, then somebody else was mentioning about the Kuiper build. Um, so Analog Devices actually makes a Linux distribution available for the Raspberry Pi and uh, Zinc uh, SOCs and uh, Intel SOCs, which we call uh, Kuiper. Trying to stay with the uh, astronomy theme, I guess. Um, yeah. uh, and, there's I, and, all, and, all, and all the GNU radio blocks and uh, GR38 is actually on in uh, default in Kuiper Linux. Yeah, so there was a question about uh, loopback. So that does definitely work in Pluto as well. Um, so uh, Pluto is essentially the same as our system on module devices or our um, you know, FMC plus FPGA carrier style boards um, from a HTML uh, a software perspective. So if you want to move between them or if you have a design that's built on one, uh, you can easily migrate it between them. Uh, I would say Pluto, uh, the really only difference in HDL is that it has uh, filters in um, some extra decimation and interpolation filters that are in uh, the receive path, uh, which we just provide because uh, we had a lot of people requesting lower sample rates uh, than you could just do with the transceiver alone. Um, but if you actually needed to do have access to more resources, because um, the FPGA in Pluto is kind of small, you can rip those out and the device functions perfectly fine. And we've done that in a, in a number of examples. Um, now, just switching back to the slides, um, here's just a, a layout of how you would configure some of the block masks uh, that are associated with Pluto itself. Um, so the one of the most important ones is this guy here, the IO uh, context URI. Um, before, when we were um, playing with things on the command line, um, that uh, USB colon 127.5, that was our URI. And that's what we're going to plug in here. Um, and this could also be IP um, colon 192.168.2.1 for Pluto, or uh, the IP address of a different board that's on your network, uh, like I showed when I connected that other machine or that other system on my network. Um, uh, for Pluto, if you leave this blank, it will actually try to auto-connect over USB to the first one that it finds. If it sees two Plutos, um, it will tell you, tell me which one that you want to connect to. Um, uh, and uh, but uh, you know you can fill this in uh, generically um, for uh, depending if you want to connect over USB or serial or uh, or um, or Ethernet. Uh, one thing to note, as kind of um, Robin mentioned before, is uh, if you have uh, multiple processes um, that are trying to talk to Pluto, uh, they need to be using um, IP contexts. So you can't use the USB colon. Um, if you had, say, two, um, two flow graphs that can do radio running. Um, since they can't really communicate with each other, uh, we can't share context between them. So uh, if you're using the USB context, uh, one would grab the device, and then you couldn't be able to find it on the second, uh, uh, on the second flow graph or the second process. 
Uh, but if you wanted to do that, you just switch over to the IP-based ones, uh, and then you can totally do that. Um, and we do that all the time when we're running things like GNU Radio and OSC together, or GNU Radio and um, the I.O. tools, or GNU Radio MATLAB, or some other custom application. Uh, so you can simultaneously talk to the device uh, from different uh, mediums or even from different computers if you wanted to do that. Okay. Um, and just uh, some other settings here. Uh, I think LO frequency sample rates and uh, are, are pretty uh, self-explanatory. Uh, RF bandwidth. Um, so this is actually the, the, the bandwidth of the front-end analog filter that's in the transceiver itself. Um, so uh, typically, uh, this would be less than the sample rate that you pick. Um, and uh, this will do some just uh, some knockdown of some of the front end uh, signaling that would come through. So um, and, and, and uh, that is that is actually RF bandwidth, not baseband bandwidth. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and it, it's it's completely actually independent of sample rate. So uh, you can set this to um, any number between um, 200 kilohertz and 56 megahertz. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the on the transmit and then receive is uh, 48. I believe, Robin. Uh, I. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so buffer size. This is the actual size of the the buffers that it pulls back from the physical hardware. This is not actually the buffers that it produces from the block. So if you have a source block, it's not producing. Um, you know, it's not forcing the scheduler to spit out uh, buffers of that size. It simply was pulling back from hardware or sending to hardware. Um, cyclic is one of the most confusing ones. Um, so when you have this enabled, what it, the, the block will do is actually uh, consume the first buffer that you pass it on transmit, and then just send that once to the hardware, and then the hardware will continuously repeat it. Uh, so if you don't want to deal with things like um, uh, underflows uh, on the, the transmit side, um, turn this on and it will continually repeat uh, the same buffer. And then you don't kind of like use extra bandwidth that you might want for uh, the receive side. And this is really, really handy for debugging purposes and um, just transmitting something that you just want repeated over and over and over. Uh, but if you plan on actually changing the waveform um, uh, as uh, over time, uh, don't turn that on. Uh, it, will, it will get you really confused if you do. Um, so the last two uh, are um, the filter settings for the device. Now, uh, how the transceiver works is that it uses um, a number of decimation stages inside of it. And to achieve certain sample rates, uh, you have to turn on certain filters and certain decimators. Um, so to go below um, 2.084, uh, mega samples a second, you actually have to enable filters. And to do this, uh, we just have kind of a few methods. Uh, one is uh, what we call auto filter, and so we'll just load up some generic wideband filters um, into the device. Um, and that will allow you get, to get down to uh, 520.8333 um, kilohertz. Um, and then you can get an additional eight uh, decimation out of that with the internal decimators inside Pluto. Um, if you want to have a custom fur, uh, you can load that directly through this dialog, uh, and we do have a tool that will allow you to generate those those filters automatically. Uh, there are a lot of rules around them, so you have to you can't just put any filter uh, inside uh, that dialog there. Okay, um, so uh, on the right, the only difference so this is the, the the receive side. The only real difference are these uh, these corrections that you can turn on. Um, so these are related to um, very specific corrections that are associated with zero IF based devices. Um, so the uh, RF and baseband DC correction, they'll remove DC components, uh, not perfectly, but uh, if you don't turn them on, you'll see uh, definitely DC spikes um, in spectrum that you actually pull back. Um, so effectively what they do is they operate as basically filters um, that knock down uh, DC components. Um, of signals that you get back. If you don't care about that, you know, definitely turn them off. Um, but uh, if you have like a wideband signal, uh, usually you want to leave them on. Um, and then Quadrature is just tracking uh, and associated with IQ tracking. So if you have images, uh, that will help get rid of them uh, as the radio uh, runs.
Okay. Um, now just a, just a few examples that actually show how you can um, build up um, basic um, uh, basic uh, uh, flows using the generic blocks. So, so far we've pretty much talked about uh, like using the, um, uh, using uh, like the Pluto SDR source and sync directly. But if you wanted to use something more generically, um, this is how you might go about doing that. So in this, uh, in this image on the top left, we're just uh, printing out some of the uh, devices that might be uh, available on your board. So this is just uh, you know, what we saw before, where we have our uh, N361Fi, um, receive driver, and transmit driver. Now, how you would actually take this information and put it in a generic block is that uh, you would take the URI, uh, for one, and then take your uh, device name, which is the um, basically the, the driver that's associated with the buffers that you care about. Uh, so this is, we're filling in 89361 LPC, which is the receive driver. If you had, if you're using the um, device sync block, this would be the DDS core LPC driver that you'd fill in here. Uh, phi device, this is the, the control plane that you'd fill in. And this is specific to attributes that you want to write. So any attributes or parameters that you want to write in this field uh, will be written to this device. And that's how you fill it out. So um, here we're just setting the RF bandwidth to some value. You can just fill this in as um, basically a, a list of, uh, of strings, and then it will write to the write uh, to the driver uh, when you hit uh, when you initialize the flow graph. So um, how this is set up is uh, basically a simplified um, FM comms or Pluto block where we have voltage zero and voltage one channels enabled, and that will expose two channels on the block. Um, and these are the INQ channels for the device. Buffer is the same. And additionally, you can do decimation or interpolation here if you want. Um, so if you have a more generic uh, based device where you don't maybe not care about aliasing, um, you can turn on decimation or interpolation. But this is how you would construct uh, a very generic interface uh, to any IO driver, where you're just filling in the, the device name and the five device for the control plane uh, driver, and then uh, the attributes that you really care about and the channels that you care about. LPC, uh, so there's a question about what does LPC mean? Um, so it means low uh, pin count or low pin connector. Um, if you use uh, our, um, uh, so the FMC card itself will connect to a LPC FMC connector um, if you have the FM comms boards. So that's kind of the lineage of the driver itself. Uh, if you're using a device like uh, uh, 9371 or ADRV 9009 or like a high-speed DAC or ADC that would be hooked up to a high pin count connector on an FPGA, the driver would actually have HPC in the name because that's what it was developed for. So that's what the LPC, HPC uh, namings and the drivers mean. OK. Um, so the, I believe the, the last block we're going to be talking about is um, the, the attribute sync and the attribute source blocks. Um, so these are actually designed. So if you want to get at individual attributes, uh, you can do that um, uh, uh, through, uh, through tagging. So uh, one uh, issue with actually changing attributes on the Pluto interfaces uh, that we'll talk about uh, in a second is that uh, if you update any of the fields on, uh, on the mask of the block, uh, it actually update all of the fields. So that could be um, good and bad. It allows you to write a lot of different attributes simultaneously, um, but uh, it can do things like interrupt the data flow that's coming in. So if you're doing things like changing the sample rate, that will cause a big spike in the data because it's, the chip is actually doing a number of things. And to avoid that or to get at to uh, generic or uh, individual attributes, we can use uh, our attribute sync or attribute source blocks. Um, so, they, uh, so this is just an example of a IO attribute sync block uh, where we're filling in the URI, just like we did before, the device, if it's a channel or a device attribute, uh, if it's a channel, you'll get a, a channel uh, number to fill in. And then any message that you provide in, it will write it to that channel or to that uh, that device attribute. And these are done through uh, just generic PTMs. So where the key is 
uh, the attribute name. So this would be like RF bandwidth. And then uh, the value would be the value that you want to write into that. So um, if you pass this uh, this message into um, the the sync block, you would simply get uh, this would update the um, uh, the device uh, or that attribute on the device to uh, 23 megahertz. And to simplify things a little bit, we actually added a, like kind of a utility block here called IO Updater, uh, and this is similar to the strobe block in Vino Radio. Um, but you uh, fill in like an attribute, you fill in a value and how um, often that you want to write to it. And um, what we typically do is like we'll tie the value into like a slider or a range in uh, GRC um, so we can um, update things in real time uh, or interactively in real time on the device. Um, and uh, so on the other side, uh, we have the the source box. So if we want to read information from uh, from the drivers, we can do that directly. Um, so before, when we were looking at the I/O attributes, we're kind of pulling out information this way, where we were saying I/O attributes, setting the URI that we care about. Um, this uppercase D is for debug. Um, so we're pulling out a debug attribute from this driver, and this is the name of the attribute that we care about. Uh, LMT overload high threshold, which is something associated with the AGC. Uh, and if you wanted to view this in real time, uh, you would simply plug in uh, that attribute name, uh, that driver name that we see here, as well as the URI, um, and then we would set the interval how how quickly it needs to read from uh, uh, from that source block or from the physical hardware itself. And you can view that in, in a scope. This is really useful for just understanding what's going on in the device. Um, it's commonly used to read out things like the RSSI um, to get uh, RSSI information or look at the received signal strength um, over time. Okay, um, so uh, the last part, uh, I'm just going to show uh, just a little example uh, of using GRIO to talk to to talk to Pluto. Uh, and uh, so this example will be done in um, uh, the example that I'm going to show. Uh, is actually what you would do in the lab as well. Um, but uh, I'm just going to show it quickly here. I know we're a little tight on time, so uh, I'll just uh, jump right into it. And this uh, example that I'll be showing is will be done with uh, GR37, but the same thing works in 3.8 and 3.9. Okay. Uh, Robin, can you see my screen? Uh, okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. So here I just have a simple flow graph of, um, so I have a Pluto sync block and a Pluto source block. And they're just being, I'm piping a sinusoid uh, into the, to the transmitter and then pulling back um, the, uh, some time domain data. Um, into the, the time scope here. And then I have two sliders, one that controls a, uh, a tone or the frequency of the tone, as well as um, a slider that controls the receive gain. I'll just hit play here. So uh, uh, in this mode, um, Pluto is actually in manual mode, so I can control the gain of the device. But the thing that we see is that um, we're actually saturating. So uh, we're, you know, uh, we're clipping uh, in the data that we're coming back. Uh, and, you know, there's two ways to fix this. You could uh, decrease the uh, the scale of the tone that we're sending to the device, or we can simply decrease the uh, the, the gain of the receiver, which we'll do here. Right. And you saw that kind of, like, uh, delayed a little bit when I did that. So if I increase the gain, you'll see a delay. And the reason it does that is because I'm actually modifying an attribute that is on... So this is where that, uh, that manual gain control is updating. It's in the block mask. And when I update that, it's actually writing all of the attributes that are associated with the block mask. So it's changing, it's updating the LO, it's updating the snap rate, it's updating the RF bandwidth, all of these settings uh, when I, I toggle those things. So you know, if you want to do things that way, um, that's perfectly fine. Um, but you'll have like a interruption inside the uh, uh, inside the data stream a little bit um, uh, when you're pulling back uh, information, just to just to be aware of that. 
um, you know, and this, this isn't related to the, the sliders that I'm using because I can, you know, change the frequency, uh, which is just doing a software change to the signal source. So it's not like that GNU radio is running uh, slowly or something like that. So this is just something to be aware of uh, with a device. Now, uh, one thing that you can do uh, is instead use these attribute uh, updater blocks and attribute sync blocks. So in this case, I have uh, it set up, I know it's a little dark, but uh, uh, I have it set up as a channel um, to write to a channel um, attribute for the fly driver to voltage zero. And then inside the gain updater block, I'm actually defining to tell it to update hardware gain. And then the value is actually from another slider that I have going on. So this is not updating things directly from the mask, but instead using those attribute updater blocks. And if we run this, uh, save. So again, we see that clipping again, but now if I change this, um, I, we don't see that, that big interruption in the data that we see. So there is a slight delay because um, how I'm interacting with uh, this is actually through basically like a strobing block, um, but we don't see that, that interruption uh, in the data stream that we saw before. So this is just something I want you to be aware of. If you want to change things adaptively or on the fly uh, with Pluto or uh, some of the I/O blocks uh, really, you know, use the the I/O attribute blocks. They they make it a lot simpler, um, and you can get a real kind of like fine grain um, attributes inside the the drivers if you want to do that. And again, you know, if I, this is not like some trick I'm playing with in your radio. It's it's all um, just uh, uh, it's how I'm controlling the physical hardware. That's important. Okay, so I'll hand things back to you, Robin, to, uh, to close it out. Yeah, sounds great. Um, did anybody have any questions? So I, I posted the um, the link to the 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 lab in the session um, in the chat window. So if people wanted to go through that and 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 add stuff on cards and that, that kind of stuff, that's not a problem. Um, or ask questions on Engineer Zone and uh, go from there. That'd be great. Um, so uh, at this point in time, Pluto is Pluto. Pluto can sample at 61.44 mega samples a second, uh, but they're like the uh, Zinc 7000s do not support USB 3. Um, and uh, one of the questions do Pluto and other EVM modules have a, a lifetime? Oh, yeah. So uh, most. Um, um, like most semiconductor suppliers will support it and the chip goes out of production, which is uh, typically a long time because it is uh, designed into many, many different um, uh, long life cycle devices. Uh, if you do want to get uh, support, there's lots of documentation on the wiki. Um, Travis and I both hang out, um, ask, answer questions on uh, Engineer Zone in the virtual classroom is mainly where we do a lot of the support for Pluto. Um, if you want to get into the internals of Pluto, you can ask questions on the FPGA portion of Engineer Zone or the uh, um, uh, Linux side. Um, there's a variety of different firmware for uh, for Pluto. One of the, the, the most popular probably uh, custom firmware images uh, actually is uh, the ones that are do digital TV. Um, maybe Travis, can you describe um, what you did for the fast frequency hopping example in HDL? Uh, yeah, so uh, we have an example um, that um, it adds just a, an extra IP into the HDL that hooks up to um, uh, basically the GPIOs that are connected to the transceiver. And uh, we use those to control um, uh, profiles that allow you to hop the LO, and you can do it at uh, extremely fast speeds, so 25 microseconds, 
uh, is the uh, is the um, the switching time uh, or settling time between LO change and settling. Um, so this and it, and it has a custom driver, and uh, you can control it directly through GNU Radio. The the hopping of the device. Um, we have an example that actually uh, is similar to uh, Phosphor, uh, where we do all the um, FFTs, all the the log conversion in the FPGA, and we just spit back bins, um, which is uh, you know, and and and, uh, and then display the bins in uh, in GNU Radio, similar to how it's done on the E three ten or the uh, the X three ten. And go ahead, Rob. Sorry, go ahead, Travis. I was just gonna say that, like, um, you know, all the firmware is open. So if you want to make changes, you know, to the HDL, to the to the drivers, to user space on Pluto, <clears throat> um, you can totally do that. And we have documentation that brings you through the entire process of uh, building HDL, uh, building build roots. Um, we have scripts that kind of automate a lot of the process. But if you want to do, um, you know, every little step on your own, we do have uh, documentation that tells you how to do that. Yeah, so the documentation was somebody asked about, you know, like is the um, Pluto and other evaluation hardware made available as a reference design? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, on ADI's GitHub, so Travis, can you go to that for a second? And, and I know we're totally running out of time. So if people want to stay, that's great. If you want, if we need to stop, that's fine too. But if we go to um, GitHub in a browser, you can just go to analog devices or... Uh, Yeah, it's uh, git.com slash analog devices, Inc. And there will be an HDL repository, a Linux repository. There's also a Pluto firmware repository. And maybe just go to that one, Travis, just uh, if you search for Pluto firmware. That actually is a repository with uh, three different sub modules for build root, for HDL, for the Linux kernel. And that will actually check all these out, uh, check to see if you have Avato, the Webpack installed, uh, build everything up and actually give you firmware images that uh, you can go right onto the device. Yeah, so you, you don't need a um, you don't need a paper version of Avato, you can use Webpack and to build the HDL for it. Um, have we done anything with ATS3 or ATS3 ATSC3? Uh, I don't know Travis, have you do, I I haven't done anything. I don't know if Oh, I think we're getting kicked out right now. So, or I saw a message that says screen, screen sharing was ending. Uh, I, I was just uh, stopping my sharing. Oh, um, okay, okay. But yeah, if you, if people do have questions, de definitely follow up. Um, thanks everybody for uh, hanging out. And I apologize again for the device not getting sent out ahead of time. So, but uh, they should be out shortly. Yeah, if, if you do have any questions, uh, we are available in the the analog uh, analog channel. So you know, feel free to uh, uh, come and chat with us. Okay, well, thanks very much for anybody's time. I don't know if Derek is back on or um, we just wrap things up ourselves, but I think we're pretty much done. So thanks very much for everybody's help. And I have no idea how to stop the recording. Maybe we can pause it.